All right, let's bring in our next guest, the Harvard University astrophysicist, professor of science. He is the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Center for Astrophysics, Physics, I'm sorry, and the author of Interstellar, The Search for Extraterrestrial Life and Our Future in the Stars. We are happy to bring in Professor Avi Loeb. Professor, very good to have you, sir. Um, let's just jump right into this. So there's a couple of objects that, that NASA and others are looking at out in the in the in the world in the universe in the stars they say it's meteorites etc comets you say sir something completely different let's talk specifically comet 3i atlas and then also cneos 2014 tell us what you think these objects are yeah so um this is the third uh, interstellar object uh, in other words a, an object that came from outside the solar system that was spotted by telescopes uh, around the world and um, what is unusual about it is, first of all, it's relatively bright. So if uh, we're seeing the reflection of sunlight from a solid object, it has to be bigger than Manhattan Island, 20 kilometers in diameter. And uh, moreover, there is no cometary tail behind it. That's the signature of a comet. What you often see is dust uh, coming out of the comet and then being pushed to the behind the comet away from the sun by the solar radiation, and we don't see that here. And there is only a glow of light in front of the object. And even more puzzling is the trajectory of this object because it lies in the plane of the planets around the sun, the so-called ecliptic plane, and uh, within five degrees. And the chance of that happening at random is one in 500. And moreover, it will get very close to Mars, Venus, and Jupiter along its path. And that requires very fine-tuned timing of its arrival because these planets are moving around the sun. And the chance of that happening at random is one in 20,000. So there are all these coincidences. And uh, it will also arrive closest to the sun when the earth would be on the other side of the sun. We won't be able to observe it. So the question is, was this trajectory designed by some intelligence? Is it a spacecraft? or a rock. And of course, we can tell the difference if we had enough data. At the moment, it, it is relatively far, but as it gets closer to the sun in the coming month or two, uh, it will get closest to the sun on October 29th. And uh, in principle, we'll, we'll know better whether it's a, a natural object like a comet, or uh, maybe uh, the first encounter with some uh, alien technology. So, sir, and sir I, is it, is it, is it yeah. uh, improper to, to I, I guess, say that you've been out there saying, suggesting it could be an um, 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 alien or a probe, even some sort of drone directed by a, an, another life form from somewhere else? In, in specifically, you say it, it's too coincidental to have this type of path without having a, some sort of natural, I guess, direction by someone doing this, some being doing this. It wouldn't happen in the, in the natural world. Is that about right? Yeah, so if we were to design a probe that will enter the solar system, and if we wanted to get close to planets so that we can send mini probes that will reach those planets, then this is the kind of trajectory that we will design in the sense that uh, it will meet uh, three planets along its path, uh, Mars, uh, Venus and, and, and Jupiter, and uh, it will also not be easy for us to launch any rocket that will intercept it because it's moving really fast. Uh, nearest to the sun, it will move three times faster than our fastest rockets. And it comes on a retrograde uh, trajectory opposite to the motion of planets. So anything coming off it or if it maneuvers, uh, it makes it easier for it to actually intercept the planet because it moves towards the planet rather than chase it. Uh, so all of these are indications that maybe the trajectory was designed, but the best way to figure it out is to get more data. And, uh, you know, we have a, a camera right now next to Mars on uh, the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter that is half a meter in diameter and can resolve 30 kilometers when this object uh, will get uh, within 29 million kilometers from Mars on October 3rd. And we have also a spacecraft near Jupiter called Juno uh, that they could potentially observe it from a similar distance uh, when it comes close to Jupiter on March 16, 2026. Mm. 
Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's really up to us to figure it out. And I'm suggesting checking it, you know, in the worst case, if it's a comet, we will just learn more about what kind of rocks exist around other stars. And, you know, I define the new scale that is currently called the lobe scale, where zero means it's a natural object, 10 means it's uh, definitely technological. And right now I would give it a four, but as we get more data, we could decide if it's a zero so, so, or a 10. So if, if we could, okay, so it's a four right now, and we'll know more as it passes by both Mars and Jupiter within within reason to, to get some sort of sight eyeballs on it, so to speak. So um, dark forest hypothesis, tell us about that. Right, so that's a, a proposed solution to a question that Enrico Fermi, a physicist, asked back in 1950 in Los Alamos when he was having lunch and discussing extraterrestrials. And he asked, where is everybody? Why don't we see them? And one possible answer is they, they are not very far from us. It's just that they're silent. Because if you live in a dark forest and you're worried about predators, you will not uh, make a noise. Uh, and you will watch your environment because there might be someone more powerful than you are. And, you know, we've been, uh, humanity had been uh, broadcasting radio signals for almost a century. So they know everything about us. Uh, and once we develop technologies that may be a threat to them, uh, they might come and visit us on, or at least uh, send a reconnaissance mission. And so that could be the reason for having a visitor just right now when we develop AI, when we have nuclear weapons, you know. Now, of course, maybe it's a rock, but the point is we are now entering a new era where we will see a, a new interstellar object every few months discovered by the new telescope in Chile called the Rubin Observatory. And uh, as a result of that, we should be careful and check whether each and every object entering our backyard is natural or maybe technological. So, so tell us, based on what you know, Remember, Harvard, Harvard astrophysicist, if this object, either manned or not, either controlled or not, technology or natural, if it does enter our atmosphere, this one would burn up as well like the others, or this one would be big enough to maybe survive? And I'm, I'm just going back to the, you know, right. the films that, that portray, it, God forbid, there is a, a mass coming at us so big that it wouldn't burn up in the atmosphere. Your, your thoughts on this one and, and others? Right. So, I mean, we are used to rocks coming from the sky. These are meteors. They burn up in the Earth's atmosphere because they are, you know, they have no intelligence. They just follow the law of gravity and they, uh, uh, as a result of their friction with air, they burn up. These are meteors. OK, but on the other hand, if we are dealing with some functioning device that has some advanced technology, it could survive going through the atmosphere. I mean, we ourselves you know, retrieved the uh, space uh, probes that returned to Earth. And so um, it all depends on the technology uh, during the encounter, you know. And um, our imagination is limited to what we accomplished here on Earth. If an alien civilization had more than one century of science and technology, you know, they can be much more advanced than we are. And it would feel, you know, if you see a technology far better than we have, it would feel like uh, the Iranian air defense system when the B-2 bombers showed overhead. It can, couldn't do much about it. Uh, and so we just need to monitor the situation and decide the level of risk that we Got might it. be facing yeah, sir, if sir, it's technological. Sir, final thought. Uh, I don't have just a short amount of time. Please, uh, let's keep it tight on the Avi Loeb kind of derivative scale. Your scale of zero to 10, the likelihood of life outside of this oh. great planet of ours, zero being no I, chance, 10 being absolutely. I would say, um, I would say close to 100% because I don't think we are special. And there are billions of Earth-Sun analogs in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And I think uh, there must have been a more accomplished space entrepreneur than Elon Musk since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. All right, we're going to leave it right there. I would tend to agree with your, uh, I'll put it at 9.999 on the derivative RE, Avi Loeb uh, the spectrum. Thank you, sir. Avi Loeb, uh, astrophysicist, and I guess, I don't know, prescient warner of us earthlings that we may not be alone. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, we'll be back two and a half minutes. <laughs>